Hi, everybody. I've been meaning to talk to Rafa Benitez for ages in the way that we're doing in this video. We are just going through absolutely everything. His family, his passion for football still and for coaching, relationship to players, Istanbul, of course, and the other Champions League final with Liverpool, and everything else that you always wanted to ask Rafa Benitez. This is my conversation with one of the people I admire the most in this game. Rafa, we are at the manager's room. Behind you at the desk is the uh, St. James Park. Mm -hmm. Crystal Palace game. The, the, the Crystal Palace game. Yeah. Oh, that's you, the, yeah. the, that little one. What is Wally? <laughs> that little one there is you. Now, did you decide to, uh, to put this picture? Yeah, we changed a little bit the, the training ground. Obviously, it's not easy to change uh, big things without big money. But uh, to create that football atmosphere and then give some color and some passion, and then I think it was uh, the right picture. So the walls are white. Uh, there's a screen right at the end, and there is a blackboards that are white. A blackboard called whiteboards. <laughs> oh, that's a whiteboard then. Two of them, and on your right hand side you've got uh, you've got the pitches. You've got yep. the uh, the training pitches and. Uh, this was always the manager's room when you when you came in. This was yeah. When we came here, it was the manager's room. It was different in, as you say, the picture at the at the back, all these things. But uh, nothing special. We brought the monitor and everything, the TV. We have the connection with the H H H D M I. So the normal thing that you have now in modern football, even when they talk about young managers, and we have some young managers uh, around, and they think that the all managers, we don't have technology. We have technology, we have everything, because if not, you cannot keep winning at this level. And then the main thing is you have good staff, good people working around you that they, they can make a difference, giving you the information. So one of the key parts of a, of a manager is not just all the stats or all the things that people can see, it's um, your decisions. And your decisions are sometimes depending on the information that your people is giving to you. So. Always I say to my my staff, we have the software, we have everything, but has to be the information has to come very simple, very clear. So if we want the players to play for the wide areas instead of through the middle, so we have to prepare everything that will be very clear for them and no doubts about the message. Mm -hmm. That is the key part. So you have all the information, all the stats, everything, but the message has to be very clear. You're talking about coaches. We are we have an audience here. Uh, we've got. Christian, Albert and Stuart, who are uh, the coaching staff of Beaglesworth United in the ninth division in England, to which you dedicated half of your day to. You, they've come to see your training, you've been talking to them about what you're doing, you're showing them uh, videos, etc. You don't do that because it's part of your job. You do that because in Spain, generally, the coaches are teachers. You share knowledge as part of, part of your makeup, isn't it? Yeah, also... I am a teacher because I have a degree in physical education. I was teaching in the school, so uh, little kids different years for three years. But also because I remember when I was a young coach and I was traveling around the world, talking with managers, learning from everyone. Even the countries that they don't have a big tradition in football, they have a different way to approach. For example, when you go to United States, they talk about the stats and physiology and all these things. You learn something. And you go to Italy when they talk about tactics and everything. You go to France, uh, you go to England. I came to England when I was a young coach to see uh, different methods. And then. Who did you go to see? You went to see. Uh, Tottenham. I was with Ardiles the other day, with Osvaldo. When I went to see Tottenham, and I went to see Manchester United later on. But uh, Tottenham, I remember because I was talking with him about that. Uh, they were training, they were running outside, they, they were not training uh, in the stadium, on the pitch. And um, after I went with the coaches of the uh, reserve team, and they treated me really well. They, I went with them to have lunch with the players, and I was impressed because the players, they were waiting. So the captain was coming, can we go? Yeah, you can go right now, yeah, everybody has finished. So totally different, uh, the culture that you were watching, living in Spain. And it's something that you are learning, so it helps you to, to improve as a coach. When you went to Carrington, was it Steve McLaren that looked after you? Yeah. Visit? Yep. And what, what do you remember what you learned from, from what yeah, was going I on? I remember there? every day because uh, <laughs> we're going early in the morning and we were surprised for example, they were not doing a proper warm up. They were uh, starting with the squares and they were smashing the ball all the time and we were, oh, 
could be very dangerous, but uh, they were fine. After the exercises, I remember Solskjaer that was training on his own, asking for permission, and went to one side because he was coming from injury. And uh, I remember Beckham and Scholes and, and Dwight York, and then they were doing some patterns, and I was talking with uh, Jordi Cruyff, and he was telling about, oh, they do this, they do that. Uh, the exercises were nine against nine in half of the pitch, and uh, after the shooting, so it was totally different that they were used to, to watch. And it's always something that I was taking notes, obviously, and something that you will learn. And then you say, OK, I will do this in this way. Maybe in Spain you have to do that in another way. Did you cross paths with uh, Sean Ferguson on that occasion? On Friday, because they were playing against Leeds on Saturday. And uh, he, he came on Wednesday and he was talking about the contract of uh, uh, King, Roy King. And I remember because everybody was laughing and then joking. And he was in the offices at the top and the players, they were telling, oh, the boss is there. And on Friday, he has lunch, and then we met and we said hello. Did you, did you remember what you ate for lunch? <laughs> you memory. Yeah, well, something was, I don't know it was a spaghetti, because I remember something with tomato. <laughs> but uh, they beat the Leeds the day after, 4-0. Uh, Harry Kewell was playing for Leeds, and uh, after was my play in Liverpool. And I remember because Stan was the centre-back, and they were playing two against two all the time. And said, tactically, it's not the best, but still they were much better than the other team. Your memory is legendary amongst your staff, and. Uh, is it true that you remember, was it like the juvenile, juvenile B at Real Madrid or something like the lineup and almost like the years of the people, the, 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 when they were born almost? I have had some, I, I forget things, especially if I want to forget things. So. <laughs> but I remember sometimes watching the picture of the team, I remember the size of the players, so every single player, the names and uh, a lot of things and games, sometimes in games. But uh, maybe I don't remember. I don't know, another thing, but uh, I remember these kind of things because uh, it was very intense all the time. When I was a coach and then for the young coaches, at this time we were using, my first computer was Commodore 64. The Spectrum Commodore that was a long, long time ago with MS DOS. And um, we were preparing my clips that you can see now all the software that you have. I have to buy two uh, video recorders, two machines then connecting both and then stopping one and with the other one. I was Betamax, no VHS, was Betamax after VHS. And after I bought a, um, a Sony um, table that they, I could do the mix of the exercises and everything. And we were going, my staff can tell you, we're going in the bus, in the coach for games. And I was using the, the videos to watch AC Milan, Arrigo Saki, how they press, what they do. So you cannot, you have to have some passion for football mm -hmm. and then you cannot stay as long as we are now as a manager we are getting older but they're still young because still we have the passion and we want to win we want to improve we want to learn and we want to teach our players and to improve them some people will say oh it's too much you know you have to relax but that is the way and the other day and i will tell you something that i didn't say i told my staff graham soonest was talking um, about um, bob pesley and people say, oh, you know, sometimes you have to put the arm on the shoulder of the players. And he said, we were winning, and he was pushing and pushing and pushing to keep winning and improving. And then when you have someone that has been so successful doing that, why the other way is the only way? So it has to be different ways to win. And the way, the way that we do is trying to improve players, pushing in the, in the right way, but uh, trying to improve them, to teach them something. And if you don't have this passion, you cannot pass this passion to your place. The passion is the, the, the process, the, 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 the improving, uh, or is there a particular thing that really still brings you uh, all the extreme feelings of coaching before a game, after a game, or what, what, where is the... I, I said climate? sometimes in some interviews that I was coming from the academy of Real Madrid, and then to finish second is a disaster. So then you had been coach, or you have grow with the feeling that you have to win, you have to win. The good thing is that uh, my family gave me some principles and then you try to win in the best way possible and then you try to do things in the right way but you have to be competitive and uh, when you can win with your players, with the players that you have been coaching and improving, not because you have top class players and that's it, you go and you can win, that is fine, that's good. 
but uh, really I enjoy when you have players that they are growing and coming with you and then go to the first team and they make the difference or players that you get at the beginning of the season and you can teach them something different that can make the difference later on. What did you take, you mentioned your parents, what did you take from them? What, what kind of... Normally education? my father when he was 11 he was working. So he was working in a hotel and he was working all his life until he died. And uh, my mother was always taking care of uh, the family. We were three, uh, my two brothers, my sister and my brother and myself. And then we were a family of uh, workers that uh, little by little, my father was giving us something because he was quite clever. And uh, uh, we're a medium class uh, family in Spain. And my passion was always to work hard, to play football. Uh, I remember on uh, the weekends uh, when we were going on holidays in Madrid. Uh, my brother was going, for example, the weekends he was going with his friends to the disco and I was on my own with the ball trying to improve my ability. And after I was coaching uh, my friends in during the summer, the team of the in Villalba in the area of, uh, of Madrid. And when I went to the university, I was playing my own university and I was a player and coach of the university team. So, and I have a friend that is now a coach in China and he was coaching Real Madrid and he was telling me we, we were qualified for the final in Sevilla, uh, all the universities. And then he was telling me, listen, full of people, young people in Sevilla, that it's a great atmosphere. And we have to go to bed at one o'clock. So and we were going to bed at one o'clock when the rest of the people were until five o'clock in the morning on parties. And we were at, at one o'clock uh, and because we wanted to win and we were there for years that the, the, the university was not going there. So that was the passion that we have, or I had, and they had at the end, because these people, for example, now they are coaches. Mm -hmm. You were Spanish international. Uh, With the Spanish uh, university in 1979, University of Mexico, when Pietro Menea beat the record of 200 meters. That was a great experience because I was a young player, and you have to be international and you have to be in the university. Uh, to be there, no? And then uh, it was called the last day. We went to Madrid to the uh, Blume residence. They gave me the, the suit and we fly to Mexico and we play against America. This Dirceo was playing for America and Cruz Azul, the two friendlies before to start. And it was 15 days. And I remember the first day that we were training in Mexico, 2,200 meters. It was a 180 in the, the rate, the bit rate, because the heart rate because you couldn't manage with the altitude and little by little we were doing well. We played the first game against Cuba, we beat 4-0 Cuba and I played the, the first game I take a penalty and the second game against Canada I was injured and then I was 15 days there injured and, and then is when I start having problems with my knee. I haven't seen you play but I'm gonna picture what you were like. Not very fast. Yep. But uh, midfielder? Sweeper, at this time, the best position was sweeper because I was not very fast, but I could see the pitch and holding midfielder. But I was playing as a rifle back, center back, right winger at the beginning, but my main position was holding midfielder as a professional. And uh, when I was doing well, it was a sweeper because I was watching everything from behind. Very vocal? Yeah, like now. <laughs> Shouting or you know trying no, to lead. quite positive trying trying to to help the team. Okay, and uh, what kind of relationship you had with uh, with the rest of the team? Were you uh, one with the jokes or were you just uh... no some jokes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Although I believe you can tell jokes, but not they're not very good. They say <laughs> they say, but uh, some of them they were quite good. Can you think of one? No, I have a lot of them, but not here. So. <laughs> no, I, I used to to have good relationship because I was. A, when I went to Parla, I was League One. I was young at this time. You have four under 20s, and it was just four months. I was not under 20. So and then we were together. The four under 20s and myself, we were together. And we we're always young people joking and then enjoying ourselves and, and training hard. So we were working very hard. And then after when I, the last year, when I went to Linares with senior people, with Pulido that was playing for Spain, it was an ex Sevilla player, and Boro that was playing for Oviedo. Prado that was playing for Almeria, played that they were playing in first division, and I was 26 at this time. But still, I have a good relationship with the young players because at the same time, when I signed for Linares, 
I was approached for the um, the director of a school. Then they needed a teacher. And I said, listen, I am a player, but they needed a teacher with a degree in physical education. So then we organized on Monday morning and Thursday morning, because at this time you were playing a Friday, a Thursday afternoon, the games. So we were, I had uh, three classes of PE, uh, Monday and, and Thursday, and after I was training and playing games. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was teaching them, but the, the difficult thing for me is that my students, they were between 13 and 16 years old, girls, all of them, and my teammates, some of them, they were 18 years old. So when they were going in the evening to have a drink, they were going with some of my students, they said, listen, eh, be careful. So I was like a father, and at the same time, I was a, a friend, no? Drink, you never... No, I don't never drink. drink. No. I, th I think I've seen you once or twice raising a glass of champagne or cava or something, because it was yeah. a celebration, but like wetting your lips and... No, I can... I can, I can taste a little bit, but uh, I don't drink. Why? Is it? You don't like the taste? You don't like no, the I used not to do it, and that's it. Right. You mentioned your mother. Uh, she's still in Madrid. Yeah. How often do you ring her? I talk with her three, four times uh, every week. I have to go to see her. She's a little bit upset because I'm here, but I have to go. And then I remember her when I was uh, in Madrid. Uh, you see the, the Ramadi corner, the shops in the corner. It was it used to be my pitch where we were training. So and on Friday she was taking me there. It was very very cold in, in winter, and then she was always there waiting. And it was good time. And uh, I remember when we were going there, for example, for people now, you didn't have your boots. They were giving you the boots. So the kidman was saying, "Listen, which is your number?" You say, oh, "41." Okay, take this. 44. Come on, shut up. You call it. <laughs> so you were going with a 44 boots to play and. <laughs> Then uh, that was uh, the time, and you couldn't complain. So at this time, even when you were kicking the ball away, you have to go because uh, the Bernabeu, you know, the, the walls, and then after you have the street. So you were kicking the ball outside, you have to go, open the gate, go and take the ball and come back because if not, you were losing one ball. So that was a big problem. Did you, you, you must have taken your parents to Anfield, uh, which is, must be a different experience to go into a Spanish, uh, to a Spanish stadium. Do you remember what they felt this time, the first time you took them to an English stadium when, when, when they saw you surrounded by adoring fans? As a, as a manager or just to watch a game, you say? No, when, as a manager you, yeah, when, when you were manager of Liverpool. Yeah, my first game was against Manchester City with uh, Keegan as a manager. We beat them 2-1. And my first experience there is that I couldn't see the penalty area, the, the box and the corner because you know, the bench in Anfield, they were very close. So when he was a stand-up, I couldn't see and he couldn't see. So <laughs> it was a surprise for us because uh, normally in Spain, you are too wide, no? And in this case, we were very tight. And at, at the beginning, it was fine because you could shout in Spanish, more or less. But as soon as the Spanish players were coming or the Spanish manager were coming, you, can, you cannot shout because they understand what you say. The other day with Pochettino, then you have to think about, I say in Spanish or in English, but uh, he does, he understands English. So. That was interesting. My very poor question, you made it much better with your answer. I was just saying, if your parents, if your parents had gone to Anfield, if you took them, if you took your mom and your dad when, when, when he was around, did you take them to a Spanish, uh, an English stadium? Because the experience must have been completely different to them. Yeah, no, it's, it's totally different. Yeah, it's true that the people, they don't realize. We are talking about 2004 when we came here. There were not too many Spaniards around. And then little by little, they are coming and players and managers. But at this time, it was totally different. So uh, the way that the, the English culture approached the games, how they enjoy, how they support the team, singing, and uh, with a lot of respect. I, I remember I came to watch um, was Stoke Fulham. I think it was Stoke Fulham. What was the score? 2-0. That was a long, <laughs> long time ago. But I remember to see the fans walking around without any problem. And at this time, it was not easy to see these things in Spain when you, they had more or less a rivalry. And Italy, obviously, is even more difficult. So uh, that was something that I liked. And it was very interesting because um, in Spain, you could see the fans uh, arguing. And, and here was a lot of respect at this time. And also they treat, especially in Liverpool, Newcastle as well, they treat the manager uh, as, a, as a special figure, somebody that's come from from the sky sometimes to to save them because you came in both cases in, in a situation where they needed to be saved. 
and how they react to you winning, uh, it must be difficult to assimilate because they treat you all of a sudden like, like, a, like a god. Do you have that sense that uh, they I have you figure the manager with that reference? When, when I just arrived, the target was in three years' time to compete. I remember that talking with Rick Parry and David Morse, the, the president, the chairman, said in three years' time we want to compete. So the first year we played the final of the Carling Cup and we won the Champions League. So that was massive. And I didn't realize how important it was. After I have received hundreds of programs of Istanbul to sign from Liverpool fans, but at this time I didn't know. And everybody was telling me, listen, now is the time that you can change things and you can do things. And I was uh, talking today about um, uh, Istanbul and the miracle of Istanbul. And when a friend of mine, when we were out of a party after the final, and I wanted to come back, and a friend of mine that was there, and they didn't allow me to go, the security, and my friend said, listen, do you know who is this man? He's God, he's God. So for them, and still now, you can, you can even Evertonians in the city, but the, the Liverpool fans, they love you because it was massive for them to win after 21 years. But isn't that confusing? I've seen, I've seen, I've walked with you in the streets of Liverpool and cars stopped. In, in the middle of the road, stop to come out and just say thank you and then go back in and then drive away. Yeah. Isn't that confusing? No, I think it's, uh, for me, it's fine. So my experience in Spain or in Italy sometimes, when you win, it's fine. But then when you lose, pff, then they forget quickly what happened in the past. So in Liverpool, they don't forget that. So they, I think the English fans in general, so if you do well, they call you legend. And that's it, that is forever. So, especially if they know that you have been a worker, it's not that you come, you win, and then you go. No, you have been a worker and you have the link with the city, we have a charity. So, I think the fans appreciate your commitment uh, with the city, with the club, with uh, the, the relationship with, the, with them, with the fans. And they appreciate that and they, they are happy with that. Mm -hmm. You took them to the Champions League final twice, Liverpool. And I think at the time, perhaps, uh, it was almost taken for granted that you could compete, even though, come on, let's have a look at the lineup in Istanbul. Dudek, Finan, Hippia Carragher, Traore, Xavi Alonso, Steven Gerrard, Luis Garcia, Riz on the left, Riz on the left, Kiel and Barros. Out of which, um, Xavi Alonso went into higher things, Steven G, of course. Xavi was growing at this time, growing, because yes. people remember Xavi now, but uh, yeah. Xavi was growing, was a young yeah. player coming from Real Sociedad. But so. I don't think Carragher was, of course, still playing for a long while, but they didn't, they weren't players that went from there to Real Madrid. Uh, no, this, this group of players, there was a, they have um, the commitment that you needed, because you needed that. One of the best players that we had was uh, Harry Kuehl, and then people because he was injured, and he was injured in two or three finals. They said, oh, he's always injured, but uh, technically he was very good. He was good in the air, he has a uh, good shot ability, he has good vision. And then for us, it was a key player. He was injured in the, in the final after 20 minutes, and we have to change everything. But this group of players, it's true that you didn't have too many big names. Even uh, Stevie Gerard was growing, but um, the relationship between them was quite good. And little by little, to be fair, we were winning games, progressing the competition, and the feeling and the the, the belief was stronger, was getting stronger. So we beat the um, Juventus. We beat Juventus 2-1 at home, and uh, Juventus was a massive, massive team. They beat Real Madrid in the in the game before, and they have to beat us 1-0. So and they were convinced with Capello as a manager. And Xavi Alonso was coming after three months injury with a, an ankle problem. And we play this game. We play with Biscan, uh, Nunez, Xavi Alonso in the middle in a, in a diamond with Luis Garcia, the tip of the diamond, and uh, Barros up front. So if you compare with Ibrahimovic, Nedved, Del Piero, Turam, Emerson, Camoranesi, so that was the team, Buffon, the team that they had. And we beat. We, we drew and we passed to the next uh, round against Chelsea. And Chelsea was winning the league easily and uh, we beat them. So people talk about this final, oh, you were lucky. No, we were not lucky. We were lucky in 
at this time because we were playing against the best team in Europe that was uh, AC Milan but uh, we deserved to be there and maybe we deserved to win because we did our job so we knew about the penalty takers and we changed the tactics in the second half so and this group of players they deserve credit because that because they were believing from mm, the first day that we beat Olympiacos in the group stage in the last uh, minutes with a goal of Gerard so because they have this uh, this mentality and they wanted to to do something special you were at 2-0 writing things down in your notebook and preparing. it's not a notebook it's a piece of paper a piece of paper yep and uh, obviously you were planning ahead and then a third goal comes in can we walk together from from the pitch through the very long tunnel of the Ataturk it's long you and Paco Ayestanan were walking and you had to define one the message to the players and two the tactics no yeah I was telling Paco we needed to uh, to have uh, Didi Hammond ready because I wanted to change the the system and to play Hammond in the middle because Kaká was between the lines it was always a threat and we needed to have more control in this area and at the same time I was thinking what to say in English because uh, people they don't realize and especially the English people because they don't realize that you have to express your emotions and your you have to pass your message in another language people think that everybody talks English but it's not true then your English that was not good enough it's not good enough now imagine then to explain play that you are losing 3-0 at half time in the final against AC Milan how can you motivate that how can you change tactics how can you change everything so that was the difficult thing what I said was uh, we have to uh, try to score an early goal and see if we can go back to the game. Nothing to lose. We have been working really hard to be here. And the main thing was to change the, the shape of the team and the tactics. Then I said that too many times, but I sent Traore to the shower. Mm -hmm. And then uh, to play with a replace for Didi, we have already one substitution with a hierarchy out. And it was the second substitution. When I decided the, the system and the way that we were uh, playing, Paco left with uh, Didi Hammond to finish the, the warm-up. And then we start adjusting the players and then he said, well, we have a gap here on the right in my head. And I forgot Luis Garcia. And then I put, oh, if we put Sister here, maybe we have more control. That was the last minute. I said, no, no, we have Luis Garcia. Said, okay, fine, Luis Garcia. Then I went to see... That, uh, means, that means for a while you had, uh, is that right, 12 players on the board? Or? No, it was just... Uh, one second. Right. But that's because I, I knew I didn't have Luis and I had a, a gap on the right side, so I have to fill the gap and then he puts it here maybe. And at what point you were told that Finan was injured? Then, uh, this time it was uh, one, two minutes to go. Two minutes to go, uh, Dave Galli, the fisher, was working with Finan and then he said, what is going on? So oh, he has a little problem. He said, can he play? Yeah, yeah. Finan said, oh, fine. But Dave told me, you have to make a substitution. He cannot play 45 minutes. Are you sure? Yeah. And then it was, oof, two substitutions and another one coming 3 nil down. Is when I decided, okay, then I changed Finan. I was not very happy with Dave and with me. He was shouting, I'm not injured. Yeah, they were saying that he was not injured, obviously, but uh, I have to trust the, the physio. And then I bring back uh, Traore. And instead of playing uh, Carrer on the uh, left side, I put Traore on the left side, that is left footed. And it was fine. So we have, but that was, the people, they don't realize that you have to do that in the last minute after all your team talk. And we were lucky because after Gerard scored. And, but even after we had another problem because we had a problem on the right side and I have to move Gerard, that he finished because um, Ancelotti made the right substitutions and he has more width and then the quality. And I have to put Gerard on the right and he finished defending as a right fullback. So, but people forget that we were better than them in the extra time. So we had the control in the second half but especially extra time, we were better than them. We had the control of the game. And they had one chance. Sechenko with Dudek, yes, it's fine. But still, we did well, and we were much better than them in the well, penalties. Before we go back for the second half, okay. uh, there, has, there are lots of myths that have been uh, written about that moment, the halftime. I don't know if we should actually kill some of the myths, but anyway, I'll mention it. A lot of fans think that... Uh, your transformation in the second half was down to the fact that they, they were singing You Never Walk Alone and you heard it in the changing room. But I asked a lot of people and... Oh, we couldn't hear anything. You couldn't hear anything. Anything. Uh, but the other, the other myth was that uh, uh, Milan players were celebrating 
uh, we, we couldn't hear. I think it's true because talking with some of the Milan players later on, they touched the cup. That you cannot touch yes. the cup because it's bad luck. I think it was bad too. So. And also they have the shares and everything ready. Yes. But uh, that was another mistake because bad for them, 3 nil down. And the team that they had, that was a really good team. And did, did you know that uh, when um, the players of Liverpool and Milan come out into the pitch in the, for the second half, Gattuso hears that everybody's singing, you never walk alone. So he starts raising his arms to his own fans to say, come on, we're 3 nil up, just why don't you sing? And Carragher very cleverly turned around to his own players and said, look at him, he's celebrating already. We have to go for them. And he kind of transformed as well the, the, that, that, that Yeah, moment. I didn't notice that, but uh, the key for us, obviously, was uh, the first goal of, um, of uh, Stevie Gerard. that gave us a lot of things. The second one, I always I talk about that, how important is uh, the team, the squad? Because as my sir, I was injured before, he was not playing too many games. And I remember having this conversation. Listen, you have to keep going because you never know when you will be important for the team. And then in this case, Smyser was massive because technically he was very good, but he was not playing regularly. So In fact, first time ever he played as a wing-back, no? Yeah, he it, it, no, no, no. He was, he's a player that to play between the lines because he has quality. And in this case, so he scored a great goal. And after the penalty, uh, Xavi was taking the penalty and missed the penalty and then the, the second ball, so all these things. A lot of positives in, in a few minutes, but I think because uh, the other team, AC Milan, was thinking, oh, we are already there and we had still the belief that we could do something. And that is true that the fans, they made a difference because mm -hmm. our fans singing and it's something that you can, you can feel. So it's not that you can hear, you can feel this support. Mm -hmm. And then you went from not being recognised from the uh, the man back on the door, you couldn't go back into the hotel, to actually go to Liverpool and... Wow, that must have been something else. I have pictures at home. It was massive because we had... Um, it was impossible to move around because it was full of people. And uh, I was suffering at the end because uh, we were going in double deck and the players were at the top. And then we were passing the, the, the trees and the branches and then it was very dangerous and the, the bus was going very fast. But at this time, everybody was celebrating and nobody was scared. And I remember people in the lamps and then it was full of people from everywhere because I had my memories in Valencia, people crying in the street when we won the league. But uh, here it was so m massive, so m people everywhere and uh, lamps uh, in the roofs and the bridge. I remember also in the bridge or so in the roofs of the, the main building. So it was amazing because it was... 21 years for Liverpool, that is a massive club. It's not that you are doing this and they say, OK, everybody. But for them was to go back to your, your good memories and they were really proud of that. If I have ever seen you uncomfortable, it's surrounded by a lot of people. That's the part of you. You're not comfortable when there's a lot of people around you and perhaps you cannot control the situation. I don't know what it is, but you have been in pops. The one was good. <laughs> Especially the, there was one in Leverkusen. Yeah, there's one. The, that's, that's we went to, it was a Chelsea-Barcelona game in the TV and uh, then it was on Wednesday for us, Tuesday for them. And then uh, we said we have to go and watch the game, but in the hotel we couldn't see because they didn't have the rights uh, or the uh, uh, sat. And then we say, okay, there's a, a pub here, this close. Alec Miller said, oh, there's a pub here. So then when we just tried, we take a taxi and we arrived, we were with the tracksuit. And then it was full of people, full of Liverpool fans. But they didn't notice and we were inside. And then when we were in the middle, and I remember the face of this one, we were in the middle and then the, the one that was on my right shoulder was, oh, Rafa? And I said, shut up, Rafa? Rafa? I said, yeah. And then they start shouting and they start singing and then turn around and with the phones, ah, singing. Uh, a woman giving me two kisses, ah, ah, ah. I said, listen, watch the game. It was impossible. At this time, it was impossible. Then we have to go out. And I remember shaking hands of these big, massive scouts and then whoa, shaking hands. Then we have to leave the pub. But it was very dangerous because it was full of people and we didn't have any space. And it takes us 10 minutes to go, take the taxi and go back. Because phew, that was uh, the feeling that was really good, but at the same time, it was very dangerous because uh, you couldn't move around. Deep down, is, is, it, is it a shyness? You are, even though you, you can't command over 60,000 people or whatever, is there a shyness there that, that... 
yeah, you want a little bit, but at this time, so normally I'm shy, I'm shy, but I'm getting older and then you have to, to manage. But uh, this time was more just that you couldn't be there because uh, they were so excited and involved. It was, uh, was dangerous in the end. Um, you leave uh, near the training ground here? Yeah. Uh, which is uh, about, what, 20 minutes from the city centre in Newcastle? No, 10 minutes from 10 here, minutes. 10 minutes from there, more or less. Taxi took me the long way. <laughs> but uh, do you go to the city centre of Newcastle? Do you get to walk? At the beginning, I was living in the hotel, so it was around all the time. Uh, but uh, now, no, because normally we live here. So we, we leave the training ground. We came, today was 7.30 in the morning. And normally we leave 6, 7, 8, it depends on the day. And your family stays in back home in, in Liverpool. Your daughters are more English or Spanish these days? English. No English. The little one is Scouser and the other one is English. With accent and all? Yeah, some accent. Right. But the, the old one, she doesn't think that she has accent, but it's a, a little bit of uh, Scouser accent, yeah. One of them was pre-Olympic with Great Britain, is that right? Yeah, she was in the team in the show jumping, yeah. In the what jumping? In the show jumping oh, right, team. Show jumping. Uh, yeah. She has been once uh, with the Great, Brit uh, Great British team. Okay, has she continued? Uh... No, now because she's in the university. Right. Normally, always they say the same. Until they are 16 with the ponies, fine. And after university, boyfriends, forget about <laughs> show jumping. Now, family is obviously crucial to you and, and you have to have family time. So how, how do you do it? I understand that football takes yeah. over, but... What I do now is uh, when we finish, if I have uh, one or two days off, I drive, sometimes uh, by train, but uh, normally drive, I stay there, come back early in the morning, because you have to train. So then the time that you are there, you want to relax, and then my wife says, okay, come on, we have to go have lunch together, or we have to go to the ice skating with the, the little one. So then fine, because it's different. So you don't need to think too much about or oh, I have to prepare this and then this player will do that or the other one, so it's just you go and enjoy. Uh, recently I was talking to Pochettino about this and if he, his wife knows that uh, when he goes in and doesn't want to be disturbed, um, she, will, she wouldn't even start a proper conversation, but she'll, she'll behave like there is a conversation going on, knowing that there is nothing coming back because he's thinking of his thing. Has ever any manager been able to balance properly social life, family life, and yeah, profession? I no, I think so. It's, it depends on your your moment, your time. So when I was a young manager, and then for the young managers here, I remember the half time we were losing one nil in the academy of Real Madrid. And then I have to pass through my family, and I didn't notice that they were there. Mm -hmm. So they were upset with me after the game. So I said, you didn't say hello. I didn't see him, them. It was all my family because I was thinking about what to do. Then at this time, you have so much passion and you are so focused that maybe you leave the things in one side. Later on, so you have to manage. You cannot say, oh, my family is the priority when you want to win the Champions League or you want to win trophies all the time and you have to perform every week. But when you are getting older, when you have more time, you have good people around you, your staff, they... They can do a lot of things that you were doing in the past. When I'm telling you, my daughter Claudia, uh, when I was in Extremadura, when she was one month, days, I was giving the bottle. And I was, I was preparing the bottle. My wife was very uh, tired at this time and weak. Then I was preparing the bottle, the remote control and the videos. Then at one o'clock in the morning, I was watching <laughs> the, the videos and with the bottle and then taking notes. <laughs> And the next one was at four o'clock or whatever. So I was preparing and watching. So at this time I was always doing that. When I was a coach, I was going the weekends. I could see 12, 14 games because uh, Cotorrello in Madrid, they have three pitches together. And then you were in the middle and you were watching one, watching the other one, going to the other one. And after I was going with my team or whatever. Now you have uh, the TV, you have your analysis department, you have your staff. So you have more time to think about the main or the most important things and they prepare everything what I told you at the beginning it has to be simple so I say okay you watch the game then you have to give me three uh, ideas no 30 ideas and at this time you were doing all these things and now and they can do it and you can just use the, the, the main ones P 
people think that when you are successful, sometimes it's because you are lucky. Happen with the uh, ex-players because sometimes they have the chance that the others don't have. And I was not a famous uh, ex-player. I was playing football all my life, but no in first division. So you have to keep working harder. As a teacher that I had, she was always telling me, when you are getting older, you have to do double to have the same that the younger women they had, or the uh, younger uh, teachers. So in football, it's the same. When you are not famous, you have to work harder, double than the others, because then if you're not, you cannot compete with them. What did Lucia Leroné say? The, uh, the harder you work, the luckier you become. Yeah, that is true. But it's not 100% right, because sometimes you have a top-class player in your team, and he can make the difference. So you have a very good team, and they can make the difference. But what I say to you is that coming from the academy, so working in, in with a, a youth level and growing and going to different levels, is when you realize, or when people can realize if you are a good coach or bad coach, and when you realize how difficult it is to go there. Some ex-players, they go straight with a good team, they can win. And people say, oh, it's great, yeah, fine. But, uh, there are a lot of managers or coaches coming from uh, the youth uh, system and maybe they are even better, but they don't have the chance to sit down there and then give two instructions and win games. That's it. They have to do a lot of work behind the scenes to, to be sure that they can win. We're talking about your family. We've gone back to football. I want to take you back to your family just for a second. Was there a, a family event? Uh, four dogs, look. Oh, yes. Four they, dogs. They're very big. The ones on the left are very big. Yeah. What are the names? That is uh, Clem, Red, Goofy, and Honey. Oh, they got, as you, as very you know, noisy now, and you go around, oh, very noisy, but uh, it's fine. So. But they are the werewolf, they're not in yeah. with you in English. No, no, they are there. Do you keep a dog here? No. No. I can't know. When you go around, you have to go for games or whatever, you cannot leave the dog there. The dogs, they have to be comfortable with the family. Mm -hmm. Now, I was going to say, if you actually missed a family event that you had to apologize for to you to your kids ever been in that situation no not really I think that my wife she knows that um, I'm quite busy and I like football and but sometimes getting uh, or when we are together for a while she knows as you say uh, Pochettino's wife no she knows this she knows that so um, and my daughters more or less they know so I want to watch uh, a game and that's it the, the difference is when I was a kid and my father wanted to watch the telly, you have to go to another room or no chance. And then because he was choosing the channel and now it's, they are choosing the channel, so you have to go to another room to watch the game. So they are watching whatever. And then, oh, that, blah, blah. then you, you have to go. When I always, I say to them, so when my father said, listen, channel one, in Spain you are younger than me, but in Spain you have channel one, channel two. So your father said, channel one, that's it. And then you go channel one, channel two, channel two. And only half a day as well. You yeah. didn't have a whole day television. Yeah. Uh, and if you got, if you wanted to get lost completely, where do we find you in a in a music concert, in a in a in a no. in a path in the middle of the forest, or where? No, I like the mountains, but not the mountains. I, in in Madrid, this area that you are close to the mountains, and this we we talk about that. The weather in Newcastle, oh this that, and then my staff they like oh the beach in Alicante, this or. So I don't like the sea and I like too much the sun and I like to stay in the mountains and stay with friends, play cards, we play moose, you know the game. So we try to, to stay relaxed doing these things. So it's not, and just with the telly or something or now with the internet, it's, never, it's a quiet place. No, no the, not the sea, no the mountains at the top, it's just uh, with normal people just uh, talking about whatever. Do you watch TV series? Yeah. So what's, what's your uh, latest? Only Fools and Horses and really? Friends and <laughs> Falton Towers and Father Ted. But you stopped watching uh, about 20 years ago then. Yeah, I'm still watching <laughs> then. So no, I, I, I like the English, uh, the English comedies. They are quite good. Just finally, uh, I remember the time in Liverpool when you first arrived and you started doing a lot of things that you were criticised for. Uh, the formation, the rotation, the zonal marking. The zonal marking, of course, that now everybody's doing. Yeah. So I suppose there's a little bit of, um, is it the tragedy of the vanguardist? The one who tries first is going to be criticized because why are you doing changing? Do, do you feel like that? Do you feel that 
that you haven't no. been recognized properly. No, I don't feel like that, but I know that it's like this because um, the rotation, we won the league with Valencia and then people here were criticizing the rotation and now everybody says, oh, we need to rotate or we cannot go uh, to the final because we will be tired. The zonal marking, a lot of teams they do zonal marking, but the zonal marking is, is not just a way to do it. There are mm, too many th things to do zonal marking, so you have to be, you have to do it in the right way. And it's still uh, it's something that you can you can improve. I was talking, for example, about the under 21 league, and uh, now they have the under 21 and the 23. This has to be maybe done in another way. But it's something that we said. Listen, you cannot keep this reserve league that was in the past. They didn't have too many games and was not intensity, nothing. So the young players they were not improving, and now they have that. So all these things that. Is what I said to you at the beginning. You go to another country and you learn something and then you try to put this or replicate this in England. Then I think it's fine, but um, people have to realize that um, you have to change and you have to change based on the experience in, in uh, another leagues in this case. Because in England, now they are doing really well, but this time they were not winning too much. Mm -hmm. At youth level, they were not winning. So now they are doing different things in a different way, and that is fine, it's good. That is the reason why we enjoy in England, because um, if you have um, the, the, the desire, the passion, they understand that and they appreciate that, and they, they leave you to do your job. And the other thing is, uh, I don't think people know you that well, and I was surprised to hear when you went to Chelsea, a lot of uh, journalists from the national newspapers, the ones that didn't know you, from your time at uh, in Liverpool, telling me, oh, he's a nice guy, and it's like, well, what do you think? I mean, wh wh what, where, where did you get any other impression? Because you, by the way, weren't usually going to Liverpool. If you had, you would have known. So, what, what do you think? There's that perception. No, I am serious uh, when I, I am doing my job. But as you say, I can tell you some jokes after of the record. <laughs> I can tell you some jokes and normally our relationship with the staff is normal so what I say before about my parents so we are uh, educated and we respect people and we respect the people that they they try to do their job properly then you have to be serious and you have to approach the the, the game in this case in the way that you have to do it to win but uh, if you have to defend your club Chelsea, for example, it's a big lie when they say that I, I said that I didn't, uh, I never will go to Chelsea. It's not true. It was a, a teenager, yeah, on yes. Twitter. But then, if you have to compete against Chelsea or you have to compete against anyone, Liverpool. When I went to play against Liverpool, I wanted to win because that is the the, the way. So you have to, and it's what the fans they expect from you to compete for and to win for your team. So then, sometimes in the confrontation with another managers. It was uh, quite hard, or maybe with the press, you try to to uh, protect yourself. Yeah, but um, we have Chelsea. I always I, I told people the other day, I was waiting for my family. They were coming here, and in the training station, a Chelsea fan came, approached me, said, "I'm a Chelsea fan. Thank you very much for what you did." And I said, "Listen, we had a very good relationship with the people there, with the staff, so we didn't have any problems. So one thing is what you can see from outside." But the reality, we don't have, we didn't have any problems. Now people talking about, oh, Napoli, this, that. We have very good relationship with the staff there, with the people there. Inter de Milan, even the same, and Real Madrid. So we have good relationship with the professionals and the people that are working in, in these clubs. But the perception from outside, it depends uh, each one. But the people that know you close, they say, okay, you are normal. I don't say that I'm amazing because uh, we have uh, probably like everyone or uh, Think that we don't do right, but uh, we are normal, and we can talk with people. And you say your coaches they were coming. Mm -hmm. mm, for us, it's the same if if uh, they are coming from League One, League Two, or a top uh, team in the in the Champions League. It doesn't matter. You you won't agree with me, uh, but w the way that Chelsea fans treated you was, in my eyes, it was bullying and it was xenophobia. The kind of insults you were getting. Uh, and that was corrected at the end. It felt that people started to understand you at the end, when you got to the targets that you, you, you came from. But again, I will tell you, the, the board, they recognized that. I had a dinner with them, they invited, and then they were really happy, and I have messages from them uh, very 
very positive, very good. But then when I was going to buy, to do shopping, I have people in the queue telling me, listen, you are doing a great job, carry on. So it's more than the funds, some funds, that then maybe they were guide some of them properly for someone, some funds, but not the funds, because uh, in the streets we were fine with the people. So I think it was more, and everything changed when we play against Middlesbrough in the cup, and I say live, listen, don't worry about me. I will do my job. I will try to to win, and after I will leave. So since this day, I think the fans, as you say, they realize that hey, he's a professional. He's doing his job, and that's it. And it was much better. No problems here in Newcastle of, of that kind at all. Uh, and I feel that uh, just to finish off, you feed from fighting. Uh, you are battling for this club to go to the next level, and without that battle. Uh, uh, there's something missing in you? Do you feel that uh, that helps you to get out of bed every morning and go and get no, them? No, my relationship with the with the owners normally is not as bad as maybe people think because I'm fighting for the best for my club. So I'm not fighting for the best for Rafa Benitez. Normally I don't have any problem with my contract because it's more or less. It's just because I want to improve the facilities or I want to improve the academy or I want to bring better players for being more competitive, things like that. So the fans, they appreciate that. has been the same in Napoli or in, uh, Liverpool here, so in Valencia, they appreciate that. And then for professionals, if they have this uh, vision, they can go one step back and say, listen, it's improving my team, it's improving my club, it's improving my business. So then I think that people, professionals, they realize and the perception, it depends. Uh, now. The, the social network changes everything in one minute. So some people can criticize you today and in two days' time they are praising you. So then if you realize now that it's like this, then you stay calm, you make decisions uh, in a better way. So if you are too hurry to do something, you will make more mistakes. Now you have to stay calm. I can read my players when they say, oh, yeah, half time, he's calm. I'm not calm and really sometimes desperate to, to change things and to win. But I understand that my job is to pass this confidence, this belief, like in Istanbul we did. So if I go half time, losing 3 nil, and then you start panicking, no chance. Then you have to go there and say, listen, everything is under control. Maybe not, but you have to try to tell them that it's under control and they will believe you. What will Rafa Benitez be in 10 years' time? National coach of Spain? Of England? Or England, yeah, you never know. So it depends if I improve my English. <laughs> so <laughs> I took it practicing. If your English is good enough to change a 3 0 at half time and get at Istanbul, then I think it's good enough to be the national manager of England. Also, we'll you never know. Gracias, Rafa. So, what did you think? I've enjoyed the conversation, I've enjoyed what I've learned from it, but I'd like to know what you've learned from it. I'd like you to comment, I'd like you to subscribe, I'd I love you to tell your friends and your auntie, uncle, your cousins, your brothers, sisters, parents, that there is a channel that um, has got long conversations about football in a different way. That's what I'm trying to uh, open up to you, a different way of uh, seeing this game. I hope you enjoyed it. Comment, subscribe, do all that under here, and come back soon, please.